Welcome to Beyond Inventory Optimization, a webcast series that focuses on hot topics around supply chain excellence and inventory optimization. This series of short webcasts is sponsored by Legility, and you can view them at any time online at www.legility.com. So let's get started. I'm Chris Russell, an executive with Legility. I personally have had the privilege of working with smart supply chain professionals in many industries around the world, and I'm pleased to be able to bring you these special interviews with some interesting and compelling experts. In today's webcast, we're going to focus on inventory optimization in lean manufacturing. Most of the companies we work with are at least examining, if not actively deploying, some aspects of lean manufacturing principles. And this is especially true now because of the recent economic down cycle we, just, we have just been through in the previous year. You know, because they realize that lean is a way to reduce waste, remove costs, and improve their agility when they're servicing their customers. But as inventory optimization specialists, we have to think about the role of inventory optimization in that lean environment. And we also have to help organizations understand how lean is applicable to them and whether it's a viable approach in their specific company. And today we're lucky to have Gokan Uzamez with us to talk about this topic. Gokan is not only a smart operations research guy out of MIT, he's also currently working with more than one global company, working through these exact questions. So that's why I wanted to get him on. Thanks for joining, Gokan. Hi, Chris. How are you? So, Gokan, what are the top three to five main reasons that a customer or, or someone you're working with does this lean approach? Chris, I think... It's it's primarily all about really improving the main aspects of the customer value. That is availability, right. quality, and reducing the cost, whether this is for the customer or for yourself. We all know that the, the kind of pool systems we're talking about improves the agility, responsiveness, um, and basically the waste is being taken out throughout the source make deliver. From the timing perspective, Companies uh, with integrated supply chain processes, practices, companies that have proper advanced planning and scheduling systems already in place, they are now at a position to make the next leap in, in terms of improvements. So what I see is that they are mature enough for that right now. So they've recently implemented enough mature systems to be able to approach some of the finer points of lean manufacturing or, or lean applications. Right. They have practice with Six Sigma, with a whole bunch of other initiatives, and there's a good organization. There's a center of excellence. Just name it. And now these companies are looking into implementing lean on portions of their business. Okay. One of the things, since we are an inventory optimization provider, what do you say to people when they say, hey, I'm doing lean manufacturing. I don't need inventory anymore. Inventory is an evil in lean manufacturing. I mean, when we look at you know, one of the seven wastes related to the lean manufacturing, it's people right. ask that question, and they're quite right about that. It, it's nice to have a, a completely make order system. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice to have basically no big lead time in the supply chain or no capacity issues. Uh, but we all know that many times this is not feasible. Inventory in the right place is, is a powerful tool which will buffer against um, the likely demand surges as well as disruptions in the supply or any kind of instability that you may be seeing across your production, manufacturing, and distribution processes. So it is needed. And this, you know, unless you have a deterministic world, this need is not going to disappear the next day. And what we've seen in 2009, basically, when companies tried to cut down the cost, they've taken their inventories quite dramatically, and this resulted in service failure far too often. And we know the examples of that. Um, so basically, we just need to be practical as we implement pool replenishment or lean thing. At the initial stages, this may mean that we may actually have to increase the inventories to buffer against certain uncertainties in the processes and so that we don't put a hole in the boat while we're tr trying to lower uh, the water levels, right? That's, that's a good way to put it. 
So what you're saying is in, in real life, companies may have a customer who wants to pull this inventory off the shelf at the end of the supply chain, but if it takes three months to get there in terms of transportation and production and everything else and all those complexities and there's variability in supply and variability in demand, you're still going to have to buffer somehow, whether it's inventory or capacity or lead time. Exactly. Okay, great. What are the benefits to doing this lean thing? Why are, why are people looking at doing this? Well, I mean, one of the first things that they look at is comparing their batch sizes versus uh, the demand. Sometimes that can be an eye-opener. Uh, they, they try to reduce their batch sizes right away. That is basically, for the most part, synced up with a certain effort to reduce the setup times and the costs. Uh, and the, the net result is fairly high production frequency. They end up being much more efficient. They drive this as a goal. So no matter what, they are trying to reduce their changeover times and the cost again and again. At the end, they have an overall reduction in lead time, which is not not only at the manufacturing, but spread across the, the sourcing, you know, make and the deliver. So, so this lean process ends up being more of an efficient workflow and a lot less lumpy than a traditional manufacturing process. Right. Things speed up quite dramatically. The usual frozen horizons, let's say on the consumer goods, being 28 days, or 14 days. Now, it is actually the rhythm wheel, which is four days, one week, whatever it is. And also one of the side benefits with that, along the lean mentality, the first time quality of the products are up significantly. Bottom line is you're seeing significant reductions on the inventory, high availability, and significant reductions on the total supply chain costs. And these gains are spread not only to those items that you're just pulling, but across all the items. Okay, so this sounds like it's doing everything we needed to do in terms of cost and availability and time to, to customer and service level and quality. Why isn't everybody doing this? What are the challenges? This is, this is a fairly long process. If you, if you want to succeed on it, you need to have patience. What we've seen is uh, the overall process, the the steps in the process can well exceed a year and maybe two years from the start till you get some meaningful results. And in order for you to pull this, it requires a certain maturity in the organizations. Otherwise, it is going to be disruptive. Right. So basic things need to be in place as far as the supply chain processes, the best practices, and so on and so forth. Because the end game Imagine is like a hybrid system where some items are being pulled, whereas the other items are, could be pushed. And it's not that easy to manage that. So if you aren't familiar with that, just kids don't try this at home. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, on the communication side, this is very critical. Lean doesn't mean workforce reduction. It's just the opposite because you're going to be seeing a, a far more work thinking about the daily planning now. Uh, yep. So at the initial implementation, some people are going to be performing detailed planning, detailed production scheduling, demand planning, and MPS. Now, new roles will have to be defined and updated uh, for, for some of the planners. And also, many times, the system, the production orders, which are created daily, they are managed out of the SAP or other ERP systems. So this is managed out of the system itself because it is hard to integrate this from the get-go and how have some sort of a hybrid system. And then there are also the other difficulties in sizing up the buffers because now we're actually talking end-to-end target buffers from sourcing all the way into the distribution. This is what we are preaching. And in, in that sense, we have a really good fit with the, with the kind of pool systems we're talking about. So it sounds like this needs a lot of change management in terms of people, process, and technology, just like most major change projects like this. So some people might not be familiar with Lean. Just real briefly, give us a couple of the main attributes. Yeah. I think I want to just talk here more on the execution side of things. So what is the typical scope? It's 10 to 20 SKUs. These tend to be the high runners with a good forecast accuracy, fair amount of promotional planning, and also decent available capacity. Uh, what I see is that typically these items end up running on dedicated lines because they run every day and so on. Then we are, from a process perspective, the usual weekly APS planning continues. 
as an added layer, we now have the daily planning of MPS, DPS. Uh, the communication between the planners are very important. For instance, the production planners, they need to be aware of all the downtimes in advance. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to make it. There are really two horizons that we talk about uh, as, as far as planning. There is the operational horizon where you're actually executing the production orders. And the operational horizon is typically limited to the rhythm wheel. It is covering the sales orders or the shipments. And that's really where you're looking at the pull process. Exactly. This is really the heart of it. And then there's the tactical horizon, which which is the continuing ongoing APS planning using the forecast. And this is mainly used on labor planning and capacity al- alignment. Okay. Based on your experience, you've been working recently and telling me some great stories about what you've uncovered at these these companies. What what are you recommending to them? Well, uh, we talked about the SKU selection. I think many times uh, companies start with a limited number of A items. This is always, uh, for the most part, the the, the choice. Um, if we start from the beginning of the supply chain, we are looking uh, a, a far closer coordination with them. Means daily deliveries. That means sometimes a reduced supply base. When you go to your suppliers with those requests, you may be thinking that they're actually going to be, you know, there's going to be an added cost on on doing this collaboration. But you may be dead wrong there because they may already be doing that with some of your competitors and you may not know about it. In, in, In fact, I heard stories that suppliers coming back and saying, where have you been? <laughs> been doing this for many years with <laughs> some of our peers, and uh, you guys just late. <laughs> From the manufacturing perspective, we are looking at rhythm wheel implementation. It means products being produced with a certain sequence and also with a fairly high production frequency. And then we have end-to-end supermarket or buffer sizing um, on the manufacturing side. Yeah, Gokhan, some of the specific tactical supplier things you're looking at is having the suppliers deliver in smaller lot sizes, in predictable frequencies like bread runs to specific spots on the manufacturing floor and doing Kanbans or min-max or these sort of things for the replenishment. On the manufacturing side, the rhythm wheel concept is, is fairly critical. So that means you're actually producing far more frequently but also with a fixed order in production. In order to support that, you need to have an end-to-end supermarket sizing or you know buffers in place. In terms of the planning process, we talked about the daily planning plus the usual weekly APS planning. Now, in order to support that, you need new KPIs. For instance, uh, you need to be looking at now a daily schedule attainment or even something like a rhythm wheel schedule attainment. And these are all new. These are all new things to measure that they've never measured before, right? Exactly. And, and some of their existing KPIs may have to change slightly. So you need to be cognizant of that. So bottom line is companies are eager to adopt lean principles. The, the benefits outweigh the pains. Sometimes it may be advisable for them to actually get some external help because it's a fairly complicated process. And sometimes, Gokhan, it's easier to influence change from the outside than from the inside. Absolutely, and you know, maybe even more trusted in that sense. You know, we all know these things. As as I mentioned, you know, as Optient, we recognize these new requirements. Uh, we've implemented uh, tactical reorder point or Kanban target setting. We've implemented a specific exception generation related to those. We mapped our targets to the very unique red, green, and yellow buckets. If you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yep, yep. Uh, and we we keep advising our customers. Right. So, you know, people are stuck with how do I manage my inventory within these lean practices. They can give us a ring and we can share some of our experiences with that in terms of Kanbans and, and lot sizes and, and those sorts of things. Um, well, okay, I'm going to wrap it up there, Gokhan. Thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure. Well, I hope these thoughts are useful to everyone out there and – as you're looking at a lean manufacturing approach or a lean approach for your organization, I hope this helps. My thanks to Gokhan for his insightful contribution to today's webcast. 
Okay, that's it for this episode of Beyond Inventory Optimization, sponsored by Legility, a leader in collaborative supply chain management solutions with over 1,250 customers worldwide and climbing. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Beyond Inventory Optimization. Optimization.